room for it. No it's competed for it. out by yeah. the existing structure. Right. But then it breaks. And what is breaking now globally is tremendous. And I'll, I'll get into that. Yeah. Oh, it's so exciting. Okay. It's so because it's, it's a. Oh, thank you. Because, yeah, it's a. It's, there's a way of understanding it that it takes the fear out in a way. Well, I, I think it does because what it, it doesn't say there won't, won't be crises. It says there will be crises. But what it says is there will be these unique times when individuals have enormous possibility of innovation and innovation that becomes incorporated in a healthy way into a new system. So I see it as a lot of positive, but uh, it's not because there's no crisis. There has to be, in my view, inevitably these crises will emerge, but after a period of apparently long stability. And what's happening now in the world is just a classic at a global scale. It's just classic. Is this being filmed? No. Um, are we, are we're ready we, to go when, when okay. you guys are ready to start. So we should so. just dive in, because so. now I need to hear about the classic adaptive cycle globally. Like, I must hear about it. I'm ready when you guys are. Yeah, yeah do you need anything ahead of no, time? No, we're like, actually, we've got it all. We're ready. We're ready. Okay, so. Uh, just pick up the conversation where you left off. This is great. We just we're actually yeah, going. okay, so yeah, we're in. Uh, okay, let's hear You about can the, double back to where you were if you want. That's yeah, right. we'll go back all over. The, we're all over the place. No, so. it doesn't have to. It shouldn't be a linear thing. It should yeah, be a jump. It's, well, uh, that's my well, preferred. I think in yeah. circles, so. Yeah, that's good. That's my preferred way. Can't good. do straight lines. Good. <laughs> so, uh, so we just talked. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, the es essence of resilience really started for me 40 years ago. Se and the paper, the key paper, was published in 1973. And it came as a complete, the, re the results that went into that paper came as just a total mind blowing surprise to me. It was based upon a, a, a large-scale experimental program I'd been involved in analyzing predation, a pro, uh, an ecological process, and other processes like competition. Very scientific, very experimental, very integrative. And when I put the model, the, the computer model together from the experimental results, suddenly it emerged that there was more than one condition for that system to operate in. So long as you were operating in a certain region, it would converge on some equilibrium state. But if it was outside that region, it would go to a different state. I was totally surprised. I did not know that was a reality because my traditions in science, as much of uh, traditions of science have been, and in economics, is there are single equilibria and the system evolves along those equilibria. This was saying, no, there's more than one state and you can flip from one state to another. And the world is very different in one state as compared to the other. Moreover, I could trace, because of all this experimental information, I could trace the cause back to what actually did it. And it was in the predation examples, it was always some low, a condition when the organisms were scarce that caused what technically is called non-linearities that ended up manifesting itself in the whole system by these flips. So one day or one season you could have a lot of owls and few mice. Other uh, seasons, the reverse, and still other seasons when it wasn't owls and mice. It was deer and, and wolves, and that there was this constant flux between the two. It also raised, to me, in this surprise, the question that has been dominating much of the work of management of resources. Most management of resources, fish or fowl or trees or, for that matter, people, is a kind of command and control in which you assume you have enough knowledge to institute a policy of, say, sustainable harvest of a fish, and you will achieve that. 
what this alternate view says, you will achieve it, but momentarily. By achieving it, the diversity of processes that you really don't understand are going to converge and make you more and more an accident waiting to happen. So when the break occurs, like the cod collapse in Newfoundland, a classic example, it will be unexpected, a surprise, achieved because you have been effective in narrowing the range of variability of the system and reducing the diversity. So the collapse is inevitable if you have command and control and you assume knowledge which you don't have. And when it occurs, it will produce a huge surprise. In some cases, the system will recover. But in some, like the cod, it won't recover. It'll stay collapsed. And that's what's been happening with the cod. So the command and control and assumption of sufficient knowledge has been the dominant sort of paradigm by which management has taken place. And it's a guarantee, inappropriate. it's oversimplistic, basically. The real world has these multi-stable states and flips between them. And that's a world where there's a high degree of uncertainty. You know some things, but there's other things you don't, you are uncertain about. And more important, there's others that are completely unknown. So the only way you can approach it is in an adaptive uh, manner, an experimental manner, where you use the best knowledge you have and you try to intervene in the way you want, recognizing the unknown, and monitor and respond rapidly when an unexpected occurs. So it's highly adaptive. So that's what happened in 73. So I said, to me, it was, it was a, a big surprise. It really was, and it was a wonderful surprise. So we began to look at uh, uh, case examples, the Everglades system, for example, or in Florida, or the semi-arid savannas in Australia, or the shallow lakes in, uh, in Europe, or the deeper lakes in Wisconsin, or the forests, the boreal forests of uh, eastern Canada, which is where I did a lot of work. We looked at all of these systems and asked, do they have these flips? And the answer was always, yes, they have the flips. Is the source of those flips always tied to key processes when things get scarce? The answer is yes. Uh, are these flips uh, uh, occur in a a controlled or spasmodic kind of way, and it's a mix. Sometimes it's the maturing of the system and then getting more and more competitive, less and less able to accept diversity, more and more squeezing out options, and then it breaks because of that, that rigidity, basically. Sometimes it's an external event uh, that can range all the way from um, uh, uh, a climate change that is is of a fundamental kind that changes weather patterns, as we're dealing with now, uh, to an energy bust, as we're dealing with now, though people deny it. So the it's it's partly produced by forces in the system itself, in the city in the forested ecosystem, in the savanna, in the Everglades, and partly by external events that come as a surprise and break the system. What that led to was a big project, all those case studies. As it turned out, as it seemed to be, there was a universal theory emerging. So what we did is we went to the uh, uh, one of the big American foundations, which at that time were very flexible. And we proposed this uh, international study that would involve the best of, of science and economics and mathematics and art uh, and music for that matter, uh, the best people we could find in the world. And we would, through a series of workshops, 
that ended up on islands, oddly, because the first one meeting was on an island, uh, Little St. Simon's Island off the state of Georgia, the U.S. state of Georgia. Uh, so we met an island. Uh, we invited the best people we could see, you know, usually about 20 to 30, uh, from every discipline imaginary, imaginable. And we came down with, we estimated over a five-year period, about 300 to 400 people came through those various workshops all over the world, on Heron Island in the, the, uh, the uh, Australia, and uh, little St. Simon's Island, Malta was another uh, place, uh, all in islands. So there were about 300 to 400 people. 30 of those people turned out to really get it and to be really the ones who thrived around the notion of we're inventing something together and we ha each have something special, but isn't it fun to combine it with the other person's special thing? They were the ones that really got it. And they're the ones that ended up as the heart of the, the work as it, as it evolved. The others that weren't, didn't go to that point were sometimes brilliant and very effective, but they did not know how, they didn't understand mutual discovery and the joy of that. So there it was, and we ended up with uh, four books, of which the preeminent one is called Panarchy. Now, Panarchy has two essential features. One is what we call the adaptive cycle, which comes back to what I was saying before. That is, there's a period in any system when it's starting out to gradually become more and more efficient, acquire more and more resources, and lock those resources up in a particular way, and a particular uh, set of relationships. During that process, learning increases, the resource, amount of resources sequestered in, increase, uh, uh, knowledge increases in a fairly predictable way. And they always get to that point where they squeeze out new opportunity because they're successful. So in an economy producing, say, shoes, once those shoes, some pattern of shoes, like the old sneakers that I used to wear when I was a kid, start to uh, become, uh, make less and less profit because the market drops off, it's up at the top there where it's sequestered all the knowledge and resources to produce the best goddamn sneaker you ever saw. But it's ready to collapse. It will then collapse. And then surprise emerges because although the collapse is uh, structured to be by the, the, the stockholders or the pres new president or whatever, to be logical, inevitably they release things they learned that were bound up. So the sneaker was, provides a wonderful example. Uh, when the sneaker industry collapsed uh, years ago, uh, two of the people let loose from two different companies ended up in a bar in San Francisco. And they had not known each other, but by chance shared a drink, shared their stories. Each one referred to their collapsed company, saying it's too bad that they didn't accept my idea about this or whatever. And at some point they said, let's combine those ideas. Let's start a new, a new uh, company, which was Nike Shoes. So suddenly, because of the collapse of the old product, suddenly emerged the opportunity for two, in this case, two individuals to by chance come together and launch something innovative. And that's what's the great power of this adaptive cycle. It's that period when the break occurs which of course people in it see as a crisis, and it is, but it's an example of a creative destruction. It, it's destruction, certainly, but it's creative because it opens up unexpected opportunity. Suddenly now, those things that were smothered before didn't have a chance to go anywhere or comes from something that comes from outside, suddenly they have a chance to get something in place, to set in motion essentially an experiment 
that can then perhaps, as happens, synergize with some other experiment to start a new cycle. For natural systems, ecological say, those new cycles typically repeat what occurred before. And I'll explain why in a minute as we get to the other part of the story. But the one part is this adaptive cycle. Long, slow period of growth and predictability. Uh, uh, a, a system that's essentially becoming an accident waiting to happen. The, the accident happens, it's a crisis, but then suddenly opportunity opens for innovation. And that's for a social system when the individual, human being, has the greatest poss possibility of drawing upon their ideas and launching an experiment. Uh, now many of those experiments will fail, but some of them will start to connect with other experiments and flourish. Now just think where we are now in the, in the global world. So far I've been talking sort of generally on, on theory. But in the global world, there are dramatic changes unfolding. But, and we are encountering the collapse. I mean, last year, for the first time, a set of uh, events occurred, individually predicted, but this is the first time they came together. Now consider them. One, the price of oil went up to $147 a barrel. Subsequently collapsed because the economies collapsed. Um, I got to stop for a minute. I'm just getting tired. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's great. I haven't said a word, <laughs> but I'm just going. Yeah. Well, the whole idea of, of things just generating out of the collapse of something else. I mean, it's. Yeah. So. So we were at oil at 147. We can just pick it up anywhere. Okay. Yeah, globally. We were talking about the adaptive we, we had moved. globally. Now we're moving in the, in the globally. Yeah. And what are the four or five? There's four or five. We're getting tired. Uh, there's the uh, that. There's uh, the food. The housing collapse. The housing collapse. The uh, and financial collapse. Oh, I remember what I was missing. Okay, let's start again. Okay. So. Uh, just consider what's happened, what's come together. It's not just these separate things being unpre unpredictable, really. What was, what was amazing, they all came together in the same year. So the price of oil screaming up to 147, collapsing after the economy has collapsed. The price of food dramatically increased, in part because of increased demand, from the East particularly, but particularly also because of the use of corn in producing ethanol to substitute for oil. So suddenly now the great fear occurred. The food market was getting connected to the energy market. The things you, the car you drive and the carrot you put in your mouth is coming from the same market. That's dangerous. Uh, the housing problem in the United States suddenly reached this level of insanity that that collapsed profoundly, followed by the financial markets, followed by depression throughout the developed world. Dramatic change. Uh, meanwhile, and I've just come back from a trip to the Arctic, the ice sheets are melting. They're demonstrably melting. The satellite imagery shows unambiguously that the, that the ice sheets in the Arctic have decreased by about a third and is continuing to do so. Just dramatic changes. The whole of the Arctic is a, like a, uh, a lung that is now beating in, with a different rhythm. We don't see it unless you're up there, but it's, going, it's in the process of changing the climate. So all these things all occurring in the same year. Now that is a profound, in my view, profound problem. It's driven by population increases. It's driven by increasing uh, consumption, some good, some a lot of it stupid. Uh, 
and it's driven by this overwhelming growth. I think of it as since the Berlin Wall fell, this overwhelming growth that's become more and more global, more and more driven by oil. What do you do? Well, to me, this makes a huge opportunity because it suddenly frees the possibility for innovation and experiment. And we can make it a global experiment because we have the internet. The internet can be used to link little groups from around the world around neat experiments. We have a meeting coming up in September of the Resilience Alliance, one of the things that emerged out of this work, in which that's one of the questions we posed, will pose. What are the great experiments you'd like to launch now, and how can we go about it? What if there was $11 million available to launch a series of prizes for each of those experiments? Some would fail, but some of the money could be used to link the successes together for a new thrust. So it's a great crisis. I mean, it's an enormous crisis, but it's a great opportunity. One of the key parts of that is oil. We, we've known, we've, people have really known that we're too trapped by oil. And now that it's at the peak and beginning to slowly decline, we have become more and more the victim of blackmail in the Middle East. I mean, this is, this is just disastrous. So at one level, I say the response to that, that we as citizens can do is to do something about energy. And we should be bold about it. We should pose, initially, a goal. What would we have to do to eliminate, let's say, eliminate oil in our use? Eliminate it. Well, what you do is obvious in a way, but we'll, we are finding very difficult. And that is to look at all the renewables, sun, solar, wind, geothermal, and nuclear, I'm afraid, and see if there's, in different regions of the world, combine the ones that are most logical there to produce a synergistic uh, interaction between them. Moreover, that can be done from the individual home to the full region. So an opportunity opens for a mix of energy sources that could be established with an individual home that might then spawn another home to do the same and the other, uh, home, another home to do another. Meanwhile, at a regional scale, nuclear, I'm afraid, is the only way we can go. Every one of these sets of uh, technologies has problems. Nuclear, obviously, everybody knows, though much less than it used to be. We're just going through a, pro, a, a, a challenge in this little county that we now live in with our cottage, where suddenly is proposed a very large scale introduction of industrial wind power. Now, this is, this is major here. I'll come back to that in a minute. But nevertheless, the principle is the same, uh, of great opportunity for innovation on the energy front. And it can run all the way from the individual house to the local government, the municipal government, to the province or state, to the nation, to the globe, all scales. Uh, so great opportunity, great crisis, but great opportunity. So now I want to talk about two things. Uh, one, a little bit more of the theory, and then I want to connect it back to the local challenge for individuals like you and I. I've said so far that the global theory, one part of it, is this adaptive cycle. Um, and that cycle is the one that maintains the overall resilience when it's a healthy system the overall resilience. You need the collapses and the innovations. Uh, the other part of it is that th these cycles occur at all scales, at all, uh, you know, fast, 
uh, uh, small events or systems and big. Think of it in, in terms of the forest. What is a forest made up? It's made up of leaves on trees and the insects and so on that associate with those leaves. It's made up of the crown of the tree, which combines all the foliage into one unit. It depends, it's at another still larger and slower scale, the patch in the forest in which there is a, like in the boreal forest, a competition between spruce and fir and uh, birch trees, say. Uh, and that usually is at a scale of about 30 to 50 meters. Then there's the, the, the forest stand, an even age of, of the trees that's measured depending upon where you are and what's happened in terms of tens to up to maybe 500 hectare, hectares of land. And then there's the forest biome itself. So there's four scales from the leaf to the, to the foliage to the, the competing set of trees to the forest stand. Uh, to the whole forest. Each of those, there are sets of different processes in each. All of them are adaptive cycles. So the leaf in the spring comes out, grows, accumulates uh, uh, through photosynthesis energy, and the end of the year stops. That's it. That's its cycle, waiting for the next spring. The foliage on the tree, it's like in the eastern uh, forests of Canada, boreal forests of Canada, the foliage on the tree is about a 15-year cycle. If I strip a balsam tree of all its foliage, it won't die. It'll draw upon the stored energy and regrow that foliage over about a 15-year period. So it cycles also with an adaptive cycle, but on a not a yearly scale, but a 15-yearly scale. The forest stand is determined largely by big accidents like uh, forest fires, for example, or insect outbreaks that will then kill a large numbers of the trees and establish a new cycle. That large cycle determines how big the forest stand, the for, yeah, the forest stand is, whether it's 50 acres or 100 hectares, uh, 50 hectares or 500 hectares. And so on. Each so at each each level has a different speed and a different size. So now back to what's happening globally. Since the Berlin Wall fell, we've had this dramatic uh, growth of essentially a command and control single regime kind of viewpoint. That's partly true, but it's also profoundly wrong because it doesn't allow for these renewing cycles of uh, change. So now when finally the change is occurring, triggered by the global expansion in the economy, it's huge, it's gigantic. It's at the scale way up there where it's essentially half the planet is involved. Human activity has added the number of scales in the, uh, that I was describing to now include the whole planet. So back to the theory. There's the adaptive cycles at each scale. We know we can expand the scales through what we as humans do, which we have. That's why we're getting climate warming as well as economic and, and energy collapses. So we can expand the scale, but we can't stop the collapse. They just make it bigger. Now much of that is because our sciences and our eco economics is driven by a worldview that only allows essentially an ideal perpetuation of an equilibrium. Many people talk of sustainable development. In their mind, consciously or not, they're thinking of a sustained equilibrium. That won't work. That just won't work. A resilient system needs to journey away from those equilibria, encounter surprises, renew itself, and then come back in another phase of growth. Diversity is essential. Um, recognition that there is known, of course, and we can plan on the known parts, but there's also profound unknowns, inherent unknowns. 
evolution, for example, biological evolution, is built upon the emergence of totally unknown uh, phenomena, uh, organisms, which, who uh, come because of mutation and so forth, that suddenly launch a new uh, line of species or new genera. That's where we should draw our myths, our, our theories, from those systems that are journeying away from equilibria are testing the limits and in the process maintaining the diversity. Diversity. That can be species, it can be human ideas, it can be energy sources. Anything that maintains diversity in a productive system provides a resilience, not sustainability necessarily, but resilience. So the theory then combines the adaptive cycle and this set of relationships across scales. To describe the whole thing, we chose the word panarchy. Now, panarchy comes as a kind of joke, really. Uh, the archy part is, is uh, standard, basically. It means organization or structure. The pan we were referring to was the Greek god pan the god of nature for the Greeks, but also the god of mischief and surprise, unexpected events. So it's the Greek god Pan together with Archie that makes this full theory called Panarchy. There's even now a book on it with that name. <laughs> so that was fun. Uh, so that's where we are now. Um, now we, we've got this global, uh, generic, interactive, totally unexpected set of flips, set of shifts from one system to another. All, since the, certainly since the Berlin Wall fell, all our economic and social and individual as well as institutional and governmental memory is tied up with what works during that time. And what works produce not only the wealth we have, also this gigantic, unexpected surprise. It opens opportunity. It opens the possibility for experiment. And so what I've been arguing in various uh, places, can we, can we structure a way to increase the number of experiments and I thought this was fairly clear. But the amount of opposition to it is enormous because of the length of time that has passed. So the, in one sense, you can say the big collapse that occurred in the financial market was caused by the economists in their efforts to avoid a flip. But they caused it. You look at poor old Mr. Obama in the States at the moment with his major efforts for climate uh, change uh, policies, for health care, and the strength of the opposition is enormous. All the health industry, not all of it, the insurance health industry mobilizes and, and, and it's just astonishing what they do. <laughs> the lies that are told uh, and the public, uh, some part of the public, buys them. It's amazing. Same with, with climate change. The enormous forces of the past mobilize themselves to stop change. What's left is the individual and the visionaries, which you, you need both individuals and some visionaries to, who see the, the, the totality and develop ways around the vested interests to spawn these new experiments. Uh, that can occur at all levels, uh, at the level of the, the globe itself through the UN, at the level of your nation, uh, uh, whether it's the US or Canada, it doesn't matter, at the level of your city, at the level of your county where we're living in now. Now what I've discovered, now all that sounds wonderful, but what I've discovered here in the county 
is how difficult it is, how really tough it is to change. So let's stop for a minute, yeah. and I'll come to the county. You got a yeah. Do you want to? Do you want a break for a bit? Um, maybe a, a glass of water would yeah, be. Water. They're in there. So here we are in Prince Edward County, in Canada, in Ontario. Here's my panarchy. <laughs> and here's this little county that hasn't been as popular recreationally as has the Northern Lakes, uh, Muskoka and Algonquin Park. It's a farming community, basically, originally. Uh, it's my wife, who is Austrian, when she first came here, said, my God, it's wholesome. And I thought, my God, that's right, it is wholesome. It is rural, there's some farming, there's wonderful water, fishing. Uh, it's one of the main passageways for migratory birds, migratory uh, bats. Uh, there's uh, uh, mammals ranging all the way from little shrews through mice, through uh, martens, imagine, martens, wonderful big uh, weasel type creature, uh, to deer, the one time there were wolves, My, certainly coyotes. Uh, it's a rich, um, calm county. The people feel their origins back to the United Empire Loyalists who fled the States when that transformation was taking place, and many of them settled in Prince Edward County. And there's a wonderful history of those loyalist communities gradually expanding and becoming more integrated. They still treasure that history. The main little highway that goes through the county is called the, um, the uh, Loyalist highway or loyalist freeway or something like that in recognition of that past 220 some odd years ago. So there it is, this wonderful little county. And then maybe I, I think of it as, in fact, my father, who was an MD, uh, went to the war before he had completed his training and he was on a destroyer in the, in the Suez Canal actually as a medical officer, even though he was only partly trained. When he completed his training, his first uh, practice was on this county, in this county, in the little town of Consecon. My sister was born there. So our family has a certain history in the county as well. Uh, so here's this wonderful county. It started to change about, I think, 10 or 15 years, well, it started to sort of evolve quietly about maybe 15 years ago as people in Toronto began to see its values and escaping the, the uh, rush and the, the, both the wonderful things and the negative things in a big city like Toronto, started to do, identify it as a place to maybe have a cottage or a, a, a place away from home. And you started to see these cottages old buildings, modified, new buildings, whatever, appearing along the Bay of Quinte, this, this, this sinuous strip that, of water that separates the county from the mainland. New restaurants started to appear. I mean, one of them, and well, more than one, but the one I know best is just astonishing. It is the best food I've ever tasted in my life. It's too expensive but it's wonderful, wonderful food. The organic farms, the, uh, uh, the, the produce sold on the sides of the roads, some going three generations of, of owners still selling fresh produce. The best corn in the world is sold on Prince Edward County at the Halderman's uh, farm. Marvelous, marvelous place. So more and more people coming in, wanting the calmness of this rural environment, beginning to form 
new activities, like there's now a new series of uh, uh, vineyards that I think are not much more than 10 or 15 years old. But now there's a large number. Some of the wines are winning prizes. New restaurants, new modest places to stay. More wealth, because the Toronto people are wealthy, or you know, relatively wealthy, not, not extremely so, but not. They're people who are good, they're, they're a mix of people who are good, solid uh, uh, people from uh, the General Motors industry, for example, retired, or uh, just wonderful, wonderful people, plus the newcomers, like ourselves for that matter, from the big cities. So there we are. It's marvelous. But then the big energy crunch. Suddenly the province establishes a green energy plan. And one of the consequences of that is to subsidize, as they should, green energy. The company that grabbed it was a company that produced, that uh, installs large scale wind farms, huge towers with a huge windmill that generates electricity. Thousands of homes can be supported by a good sized wind farm. But now think of it, these things when you stand by them are gigantic. The amount of cement they need to, to build a foundation under that is more than a small company can do because they lack the number of trucks. Blasting would have to take place in the bedrock to get this massive concrete under these big towers. Blasting has been forbidden in, uh, on, on our little part of this big county. Uh, governments can always change that, of course. But here they are. So we arrived this, this uh, spring, suddenly discovering that I think it was, I, I think it's 50 or 60 windmills are going to be installed on our part of uh, uh, the county as well as other parts of the county. It's great for a farmer. He gets uh, $6,000 a year or something like that. It's subsidized price from the pro that the province established of three and a half cents a, a kilowatt. And now suddenly appearing in this, this world is something totally different. It's not a new restaurant. It's not a new organic foods. It's not a new place to swim. It's a new industry. And these things are big, and they make noise. There are setbacks, 550 meters, but frankly, that's not enough. It, it should be more like the Europeans, which is a, a one and a half kilometers. Because the sound is, is significant. One and a half kilometers, you're probably OK. So what happens? A tremendous uh, campaign from the public saying, this is impossible. And the interesting thing is uh, we love our neighbors uh, and in chatting with them. They all see the need for new mixes of energy. There's no question about it. They recognize it. They want to support it. They would like to see subsidies like that applied to them so they can get a, a set of energy production on their house that would combine with other houses. But these things are just gigantic in intrusions. I came in recognition of all these global changes saying, well, people have got to put up with this, but I don't think so. This is too big. And the, the rules for uh, installing them and managing them are too command and control. They say they will monitor changes in bat populations or the killing of migratory birds, or you know, monitor the sound and the health of people. They don't say anything about action, though. And adaptive management requires not just monitoring, but a plan for action when the surprise occurs. For example, bats are, uh, by their makeup uh, physiologically, very sensitive to sudden pressure changes. 
And it's well known that those big, gigantic windmills kill bats. So that isn't a great problem except through, uh, during bat migrations. And during bat migrations, those things simply should not be operating. The adaptive response should be a monitoring of the bat population and the closing down of the, the windmills during the brief time the bats are moving. You start to get this sort of monitoring and adaptive response and you start to get to the scale with these big, big, big systems of asking whether this is the appropriate direction to go. I personally think we need big windmills in some places, but well away from people and with strong uh, uh, efforts to monitor the surprises and strong uh, availability of money to adapt to those surprises. We, we probably do need those big ones, but more we need the individual families able to be uh, subsidized, certainly, establish mixed ways of generating uh, uh, power. For example, we at our home, we could put in solar and it would be very good. We could put in small windmill, and that would be very good. We could put in geothermal, which would be excellent. And that set of things could make us largely independent of the big energy grid. If we do that with enough people, they can aggregate to provide more and more for the larger public. But what strikes me now is again, in a way what Mr. Obama is facing, the enormous power of established um, interests. Some good, some, some very questionable. In the, in the county, I think it's mostly, the opposition is mostly good and well-founded. And it doesn't preclude change, it precludes that kind of change. So here I come then in suddenly realizing how tough these uh, crisis points and the adaptation to them are. Uh, but it's going to work here. It's going to work. There will be change, but it will be a change that evolves with the people. And they will learn more and more deeply the rhythms that individuals and groups develop in relation to the rhythms of nature. There'll be change and there'll be uh, unexpected changes, but it'll be largely harmonious, I think. Uh, what needs to happen in, in addition is some better recognition, at least in Canada, better recognition politically in the province, though we have a number of provinces and they're all different, and federally. And they have a lot of learning to do. They have a hell of a lot of learning. It's really sad how much learning. So, where am I now? Let's pause again. What was it? I have it? a question for you. Yeah. It's not that we have to record this, but when the government, when it gives it talks about, you know, the green energy project. Now there, Suddenly the costs are huge. Not the costs they use to build, but the costs of dealing with the surprises become huge. The distributed systems, their costs in terms of the big surprises are much lower. They're much more adaptive. They're much more resilient. So of the two, in terms of short-term costs, maybe the big systems are cheaper. But in long-term costs, it's the small systems that have that resilience that will sustain the whole the whole system. Instead of thinking in five year elections like this. Were you shooting that? That's right. Were you shooting that? Uh, the last half of it I was okay. Um, because the responsiveness of a system is part of its resilience. It's absolutely. ability to respond to whatever Ab is, yeah, exactly. is happening. And yeah. sometimes the smaller scale does just make it more much more responsive. to turn a motorcycle than a truck filled with goods. Right, right. Now, where was I now? We were talking about the uh, just sort of your hopes that actually the change here, the adaptive cycle here, will be fairly benign and not as well and fairly innovative innovative yeah not necessarily benign yeah
but innovative. And innovation always has crises associated with them. Difficulties and failures yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah, yeah. So innovative is the word I would use. Actually, because county people do have quite a history of innovating. Oh, yeah. If you trace the history that uh, back to the, well, United Empire Loyalists, and it's, a, in a sense, it's a highly turbulent, changing, adaptive world that has generated this lovely county. And it's, got to, it's going to continue. It's, it's going to continue. <laughs> so where in the cycle would you say that the county is in the, the, as we're in the adaptive cycle? The, just the county. Yes, just the just county the is county. that scale. I would say it has gone through a crisis, you know, 15 years ago, a modest crisis and has come out of it with some innovative additions. I, we talked about the drawing upon the past history of organic food production and expanding it and the new the wonderful cheeses, sheep and, and goat cheeses that are prize-winning activities and the wonderful harvest, uh, the wonderful restaurants, of which the harvest is, is the one that I know well. So that's that's a little mini crisis, which was largely, I suppose, economic, some social, and now and then some real innovation that's occurred. So I think it's gone through that. Now, we're sort of midway, I think, through an adaptive cycle. The fullness of that uh, set of innovations hasn't really, it's, it's, it's mature and it attracts people and it's wonderful, but it really hasn't gone too far yet. So I don't think the county is at the edge of uh, this um, accident waiting to happen. It's, it's well before that. It's in a very rich, diverse state now. And it's confronting an external world that's in a big collapse. That's where we are. But what was I going to say? I was going to shift it to something else. Oh, I remember now. Yeah, OK. <laughs> now. One of the central features of the adaptive cycle in the panarchy are experiments. The possibility for individuals and system and elements of systems to invent new ways of living. Now, people ask, what kind of experiments are you thinking of? Well, there's two that I would suggest. There are many. We started one 12 years ago as we began to understand what was happening and, 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 it, and, and we began to expect the kind of huge global changes that are now underway. And what we decided to do, this was during the, the resilient studies and the, the 300 people we brought together and the, the key books and panarchy and so on. What we decided to do was to establish, or see if we could, establish a new institution that was different from the normal things academics do. A place that was resilient, so it had to be diverse, would be extremely low accumulation of uh, uh, encumbered um, resources that would have the best in the world involved, that would be small. And we came up with what we have since called the Resilience Alliance. The Resilience Alliance looks very simple, but it was a hell of a thing to get established. It involves, at the moment, 17 groups around the world. The groups are from sizes of maybe five or 10 people to maybe 30 people. Uh, those groups are spread around the world. There's a uh, wonderful one in uh, Waterloo, Ontario, run by Francis Wesley and uh, Tad Homer Dixon, uh, on social innovation. Uh, some of it is political, some of it is social. And they do a terrific job. And it's relatively new. Uh, there's one in South Africa built around the set of parks, that, fantastic parks in South Africa. 
and they've established a major new center. There's another node to the Resilience Alliance in Australia at the, where they established a new global center for coral reef uh, research and policy, focusing on resilience. There's the wonderful Stockholm Resilience Center, which was formed about a year ago. Imagine the Stockholm Resilience Center. I mean, we wouldn't have expected 12 years ago to have such a thing emerge. But it did emerge and it was a tremendous amount of negotiations to make it happen, tremendous investment by the Swedish government, tremendous amount of uh, independence given, tremendous diversity of people. All the nodes of the Alliance have contributed students and, and faculty. Uh, so each of these, of the 17, each of the ones I featured, the Stockholm Resilience Center, the Francis Wesley Social Innovation Group, the South African Group, all, they weren't planned by the Alliance. They just emerged out of the understandings that were developed from the knowledge that the Alliance was developed. So suddenly, unexpectedly, we look around, here's a new center emerged from the uh, sub part of the Alliance. It's the classic way experiments become established, discover new things, and propagate still newer things. So now it's led to the first uh, international conference on resilience in Sweden about a year ago. It was the most marvelous thing. There were 600 people there, and there was music, and there was art, and there was science, and there was policy and politics all mixed together in a magical, magical event. We're having the annual meeting uh, of the Alliance at our home, or in our home area in Nanaimo, British Columbia, on the island, island of Gabriola. And 70 of the uh, member organizations, uh, people in the member organization will be, be, have people there and will do wonderful things and will write limericks and will do science. So there's an example of an experiment. It was extremely hard to set up because, uh, oddly, because each, before we set it up, we said each member, uh, each node, has to provide a bit of money. That amount of money now is about $11,000. So each node of the 17, each puts in $11,000 a year. It's amazing how difficult that is to get. Many of them are academic, some are governmental. It's amazing how hard it is for those people to get what then was $5,000. Just enormous difficulty. Uh, and it was, to get over that hump took a lot, a lot of work. But now it's on and running and it has been for 12 years. So what do you do with that 17 times $11,000? Well, one of the things we said, we would establish a new, a new experiment, an internet, a free internet scientific journal that is now called Ecology and Society. In other words, it's an integrative thing, bridging science and sociology, basically, just short of, uh, um, it's the kind of work that is the input to new, inventing new policies. And we established that. It's now about 11 years old. It's strictly on the internet. There's no paper. It, at the time, it was the critics said, that's not going to work. You know, people in the develop, developing world won't be able to get it. Once we got it going, what we heard from the developing world is paper is not very good because journals are stolen. And then they're lost. But the internet is great. The power lines might fail, the telephone lines might fail, but they come back and then we can always access the journal. So it turned out to be tremendously effective. Again, an experiment. And the quality of the work is just absolutely mind-blowing. So look up the website resilience.org and the journal ecologyandsociety.org, I guess it is. 
uh, and you'll see this kind of product that produced. The Alliance owns nothing. I don't know, maybe it has part of one desktop com uh, portable computer, but it certain, essentially owns absolutely nothing. It gets grants, though they're increasingly hard to get now, but it has this foundation of the membership dues that allows, even in the worst of times, for the activity to in, uh, continue, for the innovation to continue, and for the surprises to emerge. That's one example of an experiment that has flourished. But your film operation is a similar example, where you start small, start independent, start with the equipment you could mobilize, and you've spawned three films now uh, with oddly, with resilience, or resilient, in the name. Resilient Cities is one. And they have spawned, as a, just a natural process, an extraordinary wave of interest around the world. So it's another example of an experiment small that flourished. So back now, so that's examples of two experiments. Now back to the county. We met when I walked out of a meeting in downtown Picton at the community hall where the big solar uh, industrial, sol uh, uh, industrial wind uh, company was making a presentation. And I walked out and I looked over and there was a camera and tripod and two uh, people and the sign saying Resilient County, Resilient County. And I said to myself, oh, isn't that fascinating? They, they used our word, too. And I went over and said, did you know that I'd been involved in a thing called the Resilience Alliance? And he said, you must be Buzz Holling, that somehow you knew me, which is amazing and a great surprise and a delight. So these circles of life, uh, small and bigger and bigger and back small again, cycle, interact, and produce the surprising innovations that are now really, really the foundation for change now. Finish. For a moment, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> wow. The edge of our seats. Yeah. So, yeah, res resilience is all just one part of one big evolutionary experiment, really. It really is. It keeps trying it over and over until it gets it right. Absolutely right. Yeah, absolutely right. Know when it gets it right. <laughs> Yeah. It, yeah. it never no. arrives. No. It just never it arrives. It's, it's, a, it, it? That's right. It's a journey. Yeah. The, the technical word most used is, um, well, it's a number. Sometimes it's sort of the technical stuff behind it is called um, nonlinear dynamics. But that's a little too limiting. Though the mathematics is basically nonlinear rather than the traditional linear mathematics. Adaptive complex systems is another phrase that's closer to what we do. And it's a phrase invented by, maybe we should get this down. Yeah, let's get the lights on. Yeah, no, I need. Chime in any time, too. No, I like, I'm mean, just, we're just saying. No, 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 Catastrophe theory is another older theory that has some relevance, real relevance. But the phrase that I think most of us would be happiest with is adaptive complex systems. That phrase was invented by John Holland, a brilliant guy who became part of what's called the Santa Fe Institute. And the Santa Fe Institute it was again another experiment, different from ours, but invented by a group of physicists, basically, who said, surely our knowledge is sufficient to deal with some of these complex problems. John Holland 
is a wonderful, wonderful man. Uh, I'd say is a mixture of political science, sociologist, mathematician, who invented a certain kind of modeling approaches approach that allows evolutionary change. And the Santa Fe Institute has has had a big contribution to make in complexity theory. Uh, that's enough for that. That's essentially it. Let's see, what else do we want to talk about? How do you, how do you, what, how do you know when you're resilient? How can you tell? Like if for local, for local county folk, if they're as asking the question, is the county resilient? Or how, how can we measure that in, in sort of examples? Well, I guess you measure, you're, you're re, the, uh, the, let's talk about the individual or we can talk about the county. Let me think about the county and the individual maybe a bit. Uh, we love the county. We feel resilient in a county. And the reason we feel resilient is because we know there's education for the children and there's increasing opportunity for those children to test and experiment themselves and journey beyond the county. So education and diversity of education is really, really immensely important because that's building upon the strengths of the people who will get involved in the next cycle in the, in the future. We think it's resilient as we as a, a, a family feel it is resilient also because we can go to the uh, nearest uh, farm stand on the road and get some of the best food you could ever taste. I mean, it is, it is superb, very different from what you buy in the, in the big grocery stores. We know there's places we can hop in the water and swim. We know there's places where we can fish and ca even catch fish, pickerel out here or walleye as the common fish. All those elements have fluctuated and changed, but they're still sustaining. So what we as individuals say, what, the reason we say it's a resilient system is because there's a diversity of things to do, to eat, and to see, and friends to make. Now that's resilience for me as an individual. Uh, second part of it is there's also change occurring. If that, you can't, be locked in in one stage and the changes that are occurring now are extremely interesting and very important. Some of those changes are big and industrial and they're dangerous. Other changes are much more in harmony with the history and the people of the county and they're fun. And they offer an opportunity for people. The, emerg the emergence, for example, of a, um, of a, uh, a cooperative art, uh, not art show, art studio? Stu studio in Picton two or three years ago it was lovely. It was tiny, but lovely stuff being produced by very talented people. The production of pottery by Bill Riddick. I mean, that pottery he produces is incredible. And he got some of the essential techniques of glazing after he spent some time in China learning some of the very ancient techniques. And then he built kilns there. And is now producing this, this stuff that's just amazing. In fact, we bought one, which is a, a, a plate that the Governor General of Canada now has a whole setting of these plates. Beautiful, beautiful uh, piece of uh, pottery with a rust in the middle and light green on the outside and maple leaves impressed in the... Beautiful thing, marvelous. So that's, that's the life of the county and it's, it's healthy and, and, and changing and changing and we are part of the change we're benefiting from the change and contributing to the change but we have to watch the multi-stable states we have to allow flips and and 
surprise us and learn from them. So what's the difference between resilience and sustainability? Because many people use the word sustainability, and it's fine. It, uh, it, it's, it's, not, it's better than sort of just mindless growth. But the difference is essentially that sustainability sees an equilibrium, seems a sort of a constant trajectory that people will lock onto and keep. Whereas resilience, while it recognizes the existence of equilibria, more than one, requires that the actions journey away from the equilibrium, it doesn't stick on it. Because that's the way you test where the limits are. That's the way you maintain diversity. So resilience has an integral part of generating variability. Sustainability has at its heart the idea of maintaining constancy. The two come together best in the panarchy, where the adaptive cycle is the place where the resilience is maintained. The panarchy, the hierarchy, and the connections between levels, that's what you want to, if you want to sustain anything, that's the level you want to sustain. So you can see situations where the two reinforce each other, but they do so at different scales. Uh, it's worthwhile to, to, to keep that in mind. And it's worthwhile to support sustainability. I'm not being negative about it, but recognize its limits. Does that make any sense yeah, too? Yeah, it does, yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, what would be the difference between a resilient city and a resilient uh, county, like, like uh, Prince Edward County? What's the difference in approaching resilience in a city, in an urban situation, and a, in a rural situation? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, can I rephrase it? Okay. Oh, that's a good one. Yeah, that's an example of the panarchy, really. Um, well, how can I summarize it? Um, the trouble is now I get trapped in the politics of Ontario, of uh, Toronto, and of Ontario. <laughs> I got to se separate. Uh, so let me let me think more deeply about it. Well, both places. Uh, need to have diversity. Both places have to treasure the full range of human activity. Part of that is economic, but also part of it is artistic and uh, humanitarian. So both places need, in their own setting, diverse opportunities for living and recreating. In my view, Toronto has a lot of that. The new buildings that have been built in Toronto are wonderful examples. The, the Art Museum, for example. Wonderful, almost visionary examples of novel architecture and introduced with a purpose. And it, it is both artistic and economic in character. The county operates at a different scale and its range of developments are not dissimilar from Toronto but more modest and more under individual citizen influence. So I think what you need for a Toronto and a county to mutually support each other is those two sets of diverse creative activities at the scale appropriate either to the city or the scale appropriate to the county. I think right now it's pretty good, as far as I can see. Um, of course, Toronto has garbage strikes and, and there's obvious problems in any big city, but right now it is pretty vital and, uh, and, and, and to the uh, county is. So I think right now it's a good combination. But both have to get away from oil. Well, 
oil is is really like a an insane drug. It's a cheap way to increase economic development and and growth of consumption. Uh, but the more you get, in, as we have, embedded in it, the more you're trapped by the oil. And right now we're trapped. What's happening in Iraq, that appalling event, and Afghanistan is just a, a signal of a deep, deep dependency on oil and being blackmailed by the Middle East. The only way, solve, the only solution is to dramatically reduce our dependence on oil. And that means dramatically increase a diversity of energy sources, not just one, but a whole set, and in a way that the government would have to subsidize them. Uh, building a good solar system for your house, uh, my guess it's in the order of $25,000. Not many families can afford that. There has to be some subsidy and it has to be multifaceted, not just solar or, or uh, harmonious wind, uh, but geothermal is a tremendous opportunity in geothermal. And God help me, nuclear as well, despite all the dangers. Safe nuclear is feasible now, though Ontario is encountering insane costs in, in building them. But that's where we have to go setting up systems that involve individual families, individual communities like the, the county, individual uh, government or, or states like the Toronto and the province and the nation in multifaceted ways to get out of oil into anything else except dirty coal. <laughs> and think of the consequences on climate change as well because of that. A good way to uh, and this is a completely self serving question because uh, my documentary is focusing on urban and uh, Toronto. But what would be your advice for uh, building heat resilience in Toronto? Uh, I, I don't know that I can comment well, but because it was years since I've been in Toronto many, 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 many years. Um, the other city, I think. Yeah, well, certainly. Some of the things that Toronto is doing, in fact, are using the heat reserves of the lake to heat buildings, for example. Any efforts of that kind that are novel efforts to get out of the oil dependency, the building of um, uh, gardens and uh, vegetation on the top of buildings. The, I don't know whether Toronto goes into solar power very much, but every house should have solar power, period. Uh, there's lots of opportunity for geothermal, but I doubt if there's very much in Toronto. There's more out west. All those should be uh, endorsed and supported and, and uh, s where necessary subsidized. There should be the continuation of the creative efforts, the creative image of Toronto, the film festivals, wonderful things, the museums, the art galleries, the uh, wonderful architecture, all of that. Um, people from the states coming to the Toronto, now they're just in the internal part of the city, say how wonderfully diverse it is, and it is. The the uh, well, I used to live in Toronto 50 years, 60 years ago, something like that, and it was very Anglo-Saxon <laughs> line. Now it's a diverse community of, of, of Portuguese and Italian and. English and Scottish and uh, Islamic, uh, a wonderful community of diversity that triggers some violence, which has to be under control. So you have to have a effective but very sensitive police in a world like that. But Toronto has been doing pretty well. It's clean. Well, to some degree, a lot of uh, air pollution. But there's ways out, out of that. Does that help? It does, thank you very much. Yeah. 
But that made me think of the Toronto when I was there. Quite different. Very different. Yeah, very Anglo-Saxon. Oh, yeah. Laced. Very much Anglican. so. Anglican. That's right, yeah. I was there for my university years, uh, 52, 52, 62, 72, 82, 92, 55 years, 59 years, well, 57 years. That's, That's when my folks were there. Oh, really? Yeah, at Victoria College. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. So he, he was t your my dad? My dad was a, in English, and my mom was in English as well. And then, uh, are they still alive? Uh, my mom is. Oh, that's yeah. nice. Huh. So I know one thing that um, I, I don't quite know how to phrase it, but it, the tendency that we have had to take ourselves out of an ecosystem, we don't consider ourselves as part no, of No, uh, right. And I don't know how to, I'd like to bring that idea out, but I don't know how to. Well, our, our traditions, uh, both of uh, my science as well as our living, has been to simplify the world by ease of hand um, little models. Uh, one of them of long duration has been there's a single equilibrium and we should all run, run towards it. But for this question, it's uh, a deeper question I'm losing track of myself. Well, what was the question again? It, it's more, I was just trying to, how do we bring out the idea that um, when we consider ecosystems... Oh, yeah, the, that, 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 that. So, one of the simplicities we've used in our lives and in our science is that the different disciplines, economics, uh, ecology, zoology, chemistry, physics, exist in silos separate from each other and we get into our silo and we do wonderful things but in a sense it's trivial things because that that new world we're in our new silo allows us to assume the rest of the world isn't important for us and so we can operate simply same is true in living most people i think most urbanized people see dominantly their world as being a social an economic and cultural world in which ecosystems and nature are very remotely connected. When I was growing up, it was in northern Ontario. And at that time, 50, 60 years ago, uh, 70 years ago, nature and ecosystems were part of living and, and, and existing. Now, and the, 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 the work that, the, the things that came out of that time in Canada were wonderful. Now we've evolved in a series of, of uh, shocks and developments. We're largely urbanized now. And nature is distant. Some people have cottages they can go to and for a moment they're part of nature. But the inherent linkage between societies, with people, and natural processes have been slipped away from immediate contact. But look where we are now. That's not, not reality. That's our silo that we've invented so we can function in a simple way. But now that silo is being affected not by the local ecosystem, apparently, but by the global ecosystem. And that's what climate change is all about and the profound effects of climate change on our silos that assume independence of people from nature is going to be just shattered. So the need to get that union of ideas and union of living has become extraordinarily important at a, where you live and as you relate to the planet. We're now a planetary force. I mean, you are a planetary force. You are like a geological transformation. You are. It's affecting the whole planet, but you with uh, the activities of all the, the uh, uh, people on the planet. The only thing I want to do is uh, we need to establish in the documentary basically who you are and what you do. So we, if you want to do that yourself, just give us a couple sentences about, about us. Yeah. 
Now you want this fairly light, I guess. Or well, what? Just to intro introduce yourself. I'm, I'm Buzz, and this is what I do, and this is what I've been doing. Devoted with my, my whole life to. Doing it. <laughs> okay, I'm Buzz Holling. Um, I'm um, at the advanced age of 78, 79 years old. Uh, I feel young. <laughs> All my life, I've thrived uh, on discovering unexpected, surprising things. And each unexpected thing has just opened my eyes to a new world. It all comes from initially the science I was in, which was biology. And it all comes really from evolutionary biology. But as I got into the research and surprises appeared, of which this resilience is one of them, what happened each time was like being an explorer that entered a new territory and you look around and you see things that were the same as before, but now you see them with totally new eyes. And that's what's always driven me. Curiosity, discovery, um, interaction with nature and not all people, I must say, but with people who have the ability to be to live on an island and work collaboratively together. <laughs> so, and the science has been uh, uh, a mixture initially of ecology, of behavior, then ecology, then regional scale ecosystems, and then global systems of link social and biological and economic kind. I've recently had a great prize which is a, an officer in the Order of Canada, which gives me such delight. What else? That it comes to mind. Yeah. 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 I'm glad you mentioned the... Yeah, the, the Order of Canada. Order of Canada yeah. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice for people as, they, yeah. as we're facing here in the county, here in the world, uh, as we're facing this great catastrophe slash opportunity? Yeah. Uh, to do just what you guys are doing. <laughs> Be inventive, launch uh, uh, activities that are, you would call them independent activities because you're in your business. I would call them activities that are low in cost but have the potential to flourish if you cross a threshold. So lots of inventive things, a lot of forgiveness for inventive things, a lot of Sort of not just say no, I don't want that, but rather, well, let's talk about it, or let's let's not keep you out of the meeting as you were, but rather let's get you in and let's talk about it to find out if we can discover something new together. So all that is essential for every individual to develop, and indeed every company and every if you can get through every. Uh, medical delivery, so every damn thing. <laughs> but curiosity, experiment, collaborative discussion, mutual discovery, those are all essential parts of living now, at any time, but now particularly. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's, it's very hard, much it's so. It's very hard to do in our culture, too, because we're taught oh, yeah. from an early age in school that you have to get the answer right. The first I know, time, right? I know. We're not, and I we're know. not rewarded for, no. for failing. No. So and yet, help us if we fail. Yeah, and that's one of the key problems we found in this uh, work. The applied part of it is called adaptive management. And then we've got books on that and so forth. But the key difficulty in implementing adaptive management with this resilient framework is this one. They have to recognize that some of the things they're going to do will be done recognizing they'll fail. And that is extremely difficult for uh, a business or a government agency to do. It's that issue of, uh, it comes back to the command and control, it comes back to the notion that you know in principle everything you need to know. When in fact you have to, because of these multi-stable states, these multiple regimes, you have to twitch it around and recognize that the essential feature is the unknown, the surprises. And you build upon your knowledge in relation to those surprises. 
then you say, okay, we have to have situations where we fail, but we fail in a way that we can learn from them. So now the experiments in, a, in this adaptive cycle need to be ones that in the failure, people aren't destroyed. So low cost uh, and, and modest and collaborative and interactive, uh, but ones that are low in, low in basic costs, waiting for the synergism that will trigger and let them expand, as is happening with you guys. Thank you. Yeah. Now. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you so much. We took out our boat just yesterday. There's Belleville.